right after and I've got the book I went to Barnes and Noble and I got that book and I've learned some more hand motions I want to make sure I don't do the wrong thing when I do that but we're gonna sing and play and then we're gonna learn sign so stay around for that as we continue this is one of the greatest songs for motivation of our faith today let's sing all the verses Bob Bradley's gonna lead us face to face God bless us as we worship today on his holy Sabbath day Dr. S. R. Thorward, if he'd come up and pray with us today. But because we, we do this once a month, come on up, brother. We're going to ask for the elders to come and stand out here. If you, the Bible says so many great things that we don't practice. 
One of the things the Bible says is, if there's anybody that would like us to just, an elder of the church, to put our hand on your shoulder and just get a little extra energy in prayer while he's praying today, I'm going to ask the elders to come up here, or if you can't walk up here and you'd like to have your hand raised, I'd like an elder to, a leader of our church to put their hand on your shoulder for a blessing. The Bible says it. I want to try it. I believe in that. So elders, if you come on up. Thank you, Mary Fran. Thank you, Kennedy. Come on up here if you're an elder. And if you see someone, and now if you'd like someone, if you can't get out of your seat, you don't want to, raise your hands. And someone will come over and put their hand on, there's someone right back there. Okay, right back there. Is there someone else right over here? Okay, uh, Mary Fran, would you catch Eva over there? Someone in the back. And if anyone else would like someone to put their hand on your shoulder during, their, well, during SR's prayer today. And is there anybody like to come up in the front and have a and just just to be loved by an elder? I think it's very important. This is what the, the Bible tells us over and over. If this could be the sake, otherwise be here as us today, and uh, we'll be looking for hands. Okay. Can the congregation say Gunal Shish? Gunal Shish. Anybody know what that means? It's thank you in Klingit Haida from Southeast Alaska. So that is what we're ready here to do today, is to say Gunal Chish to our Creator, to our Father, to our Savior. Will the congregation please kneel with me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we are so pleased to be here in Worthington this morning. Brothers and sisters gathered together in the family of God where we can learn that loving one another is how we can come to see what we sang about today, to see the face of God. Let us be able to look at each other with that love and with the same grace and understanding that you have shed on us. There are folks in our congregation today that need a special extra couple seconds of that grace, an extra couple seconds of that faithful reaching out to us. And we in faith ask you to come close to, to Josie Reba to help her as she recovers from stroke. And we know that there are many in the congregation here that are home today because they're not feeling well. They need to know that comfort and healing will be possible through you. And there are those that are hurting because of economics, because of family strife, all the different needs that this world has brought um, forth after your creation. All the ways that we need to remember that you are our Father and Savior. We ask that you bless the congregation today and through the work of your elders, through the comforting touch of their hands, reach out to those that have a special need to feel just a little warmer and a little closer to you today. Be with the congregation here as it carries its work forth into the coming week, all the various ministries of the church through the school, through the Vespers program, through the new ministry that is starting in terms of um, being able to fully partner with our deaf community, um, to the ministries on the universities. There are just so many ways that we have to share your love, God, and we ask that you give us the wisdom and the insight and the strength and the creativity to reach out and be able to do that. We thank you for the ministry of Pastor Bob, and we ask you to be with Brother Julian as he brings us the message today. Help us to be refreshed, be renewed, spiritually regenerated, and ready to go forth into this coming week to continue to finish your work that we might go home to those mansions you prepared for us. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. A special blessing to all those people that are watching today. I know the Wallaces watch and they want to tell you hello. So hello, Elizabeth and Jim, and we love you and all the people that are at home watching that too. Yulene and I are very aware of this ministry it's, and it's not just one or two people. There's many people. We want to pray for each one of you. Yes, sir. 720, Sitka, Alaska. We're here in this congregation. Did you hear that? SR, he's, he's watching. 
uh, at the church. Can we say amen to that? So he's a part of this group, and it gives me chills to hear that, and I like that. It gives me chills to think about Alaska, too, but anyway. So could the deacons please come uh, up? On, and uh, I would like to remind us again that this book here, this is a powerful book. If I really want you to get into this book and read this. And uh, the, the lesson comes today is people give me tapes constantly. They want me to hear some profound things that people have to say. And I really do try to listen to them, okay? And I try to not to listen to them too fast. But one of the tapes a person gave me was uh, of a person that's talking about baptism. And what made me so happy to be a part of this church is the Julian, when he breaks down the message to us, it's point A, B, C, D, we see it, it's easy, and the rest of it's for us to love, and it's powerful. But some people don't hear it that way. They're always hearing about giving more, and I don't know that they're really receiving things. It's kind of like give, 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 and then what are we going to do? Well, I'll just keep giving, and God will do something. God's already done something for us. He's already done. He's, we've, we've got some great things. But I listened to this tape, and this, this person, it said, I know that you're going to not believe me because it sounds so unbelievable, but here we are in the church, so the truth comes to you, all the people in the land said, you know, I went to a baptism, and the minister held the person under the water, and he tried to get out, and he held him, and he tried to get out, and he held him, and he was almost ready to drown, and he finally got up out of the water and he went, ah. he goes, oh, I can breathe. Why would you do that to me? He goes, well, I want you to know that every one of us needs so much help. And unless we can feel this way in our lives, we'll never be able to fully understand the beauty of God. That made me sick. I was horrified. I was so glad for Worthington where I don't have to hear things like that. Folks, do people really say things like that? Yes, they do. And this is why we are a city set on a hill. We cannot be hid. That's an awesome text. We're the flavor. We're the salt. We're the, the pepper, cayenne. We're the flavoring. We're the scent. We're all the good things that God can give us. I am so grateful that we have this church. Are you not grateful for that? And so I'm grateful to work here and to be here and to see the ministries that SR prayed. And as we hear beautiful music and as we see singers and and we have ministries. It's, it's awesome. And again, it takes money to do those things. But we thank you for your constant support and prayers and love. And that we don't have to hear that kind of stuff. That really, really was great. makes me so grateful to be here. And while you're at it, on the offering plate, it's not improper to go ahead and put down that you'd like to become a member of this church. Or you'd like to be baptized. Or you'd like a visit. It's very, very highly appropriate to do that. So as we do this today... Let's continue to grow in our relationships, not only with God, but remember what happened when Jesus said he grew it with in favor with God and man. May the Lord add a blessing to the offering today. Amen. Amen.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. As you can see, I am not Kayleen Vance, but my name is close. My name is Kaylee Chevrier, and before I sing, I kind of wanted to just give a little background on the song that I'm doing. If you don't know who I am, I'm from, I hail from the town of Southern California, or not town, but area of Southern California, and uh, the first thing I learned coming here to Ohio was not only do you have two seasons, you have all seasons. In California, it's hot or not hot, and the hot is more, mostly 50 degrees. So coming here, 40 was quite a shock. But not only do you have seasons, you have them all in one day. And that, <laughs> that was very new for me as well. Yesterday it was icy, I had no idea what that was, and I almost broke my hip bone. Hooray! <laughs> But the song I want to share with you today is called Every Season, and it shows, through the words, it shows how God is with us through everything we do, no matter what time, no matter what the weather's like. And I'd like to give a shout out to my parents who are watching via live streaming. And thank you so much for allowing me to be part of your church as my pseudo family, as I'm so far away. So thank you very much.
Uh, I would like you to come here, just so for the camera to see you very well. And I would like to thank uh, your mom and dad. Uh, Kaylee came here with us when she was 17, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and she went straight to college, smart girl. And I, I would like to thank your mom and dad for entrusting their girl to us. And thank you so much, uh, Chevrier family, for the blessing you've given us through your daughter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kaylee. Family of God, I would like to ask you just to bow your heads with me in prayer. Dear Jesus, I am about to open your holy word and I don't have uh, the wisdom to deliver it in such a way that will shake hearts. This is your specialty. Would you please come and do it? Would you please touch each one's heart and let when we go out of here, make the decision to love you even more than before. I humbly ask for your presence in the name of Jesus. Amen. You're in the uh, second half of our sermon series titled Twice Upon a Time. We are studying the parables of Jesus who besides the element of the story Besides the once upon a time, bring a heavenly dimension that is supposed to change our hearts and lives forever. Today we begin a new part in the series of parables that we are studying. Today we are going to study, and for the next two weeks, part of the parables of Jesus that deal with the greatest event that is to happen in human history. One of the, if not the greatest promise of the Bible is that Jesus is going to come again. Amen. Amen. To fix this broken world. I don't know how many times we have had the chance, but Bobby and I do have these unfortunate chances to stay next to the bed of a dying person, to stay next to a parent that is about to lose his or her child. And you feel so helpless. And the only cry of my heart is, Jesus, would you come soon? For more than two, uh, from almost 2,000 years, the Christian community is waiting for Jesus to come. And in the middle of this waiting and getting tired and weary of waiting, two extremes have developed in the community of faith. Some people have probably waited their whole lives. Some of you may have been Adventists for 40, 50, 60, 70 years. Maybe some of you are fifth or even sixth generation. Adventists. And you've heard your parents and grandparents pray for the soon return of Jesus. And here we are, still waiting. And one extreme that can happen in our hearts is to say, does it really matter? And to simply write off the promise that Jesus is going to come to fix this broken world. The other extreme, I sometimes uh, tend to call them SDA, last day doom preppers. You know this show on uh, Discovery, where people are so focused on what's going to happen that they already, spiritually, live in the time of trouble. That they forget that there is time that is now to live for God, to touch people's hearts, to change this world as far as we can. And while we are in the danger of falling off either of those ditches, Jesus was not caught off guard. When he gave the prediction about his second coming in Matthew chapter 24, in the so-called Olivet Discourse, 
The Olivet Discourse does not end with chapter 24 and all these predictions about the signs of the times and the scary things. The Olivet Discourse continues in chapter 25 where Jesus shares three parables, which basically are like a preparation for the second coming manual. How to prepare, how to live uh, in the meantime while we are waiting maybe for already too long. And today we're going to study the first parable that speaks about what to do while we are waiting. And I've uh, entitled this uh, first message on the preparation for the second coming, Flickering Lamps and Empty Vessels. So I would like to invite you to read together with me the introduction of Jesus to this parable. Let's read it together from the screen. Ready? Go. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. In order to understand this parable, which I assume many of you have read numerous times, in order to really understand this parable, we have to get into the culture of Jesus' day. By the way, the context of this uh, parable of Jesus, the context of the parable of the wise and foolish uh, virgins or bridesmaids, is the context of a Jewish wedding. Unless we understand the context of a Jewish wedding, we're not going to get the parable. So I would like to invite you to contemplate with me and to listen a little bit to what a uh, Jewish wedding looked like. The Jewish marriage was contracted in two stages. The first stage was betrothal or engagement, and it happened in the home of the bride-to-be. The two fathers will come together and they'll discuss would their two families want to unite, to become related? And if they agreed, they invited the groom to be and the bride to be to come in the room. And the bride had the right to look at the groom and say, yes, I like this man. And usually they knew each other because they lived in close communities. And if she agreed, then it will happen something that is different than our engagements. They'll stand up and recite to each other their marriage vows. And at the end of it, there'll be a scribe there and will write these vows and both the bride and the groom-to-be will sign the vows and they'll be pronounced usually by a rabbi, you, a husband and wife. Yet, they were not to uh, consummate their marriage. They were still to live separately in their parents' house for almost a year. And at the end of the betrothal, the bridegroom stands up, faces his uh, uh, bride-to-be, and he says these words. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I prepare a place for you, I'll come to take you, so that where I am, you'll be also. And then he'll depart, Usually it will take about a year, but he's trying to do his best to shorten this period. And he's building a home for his bride. Usually either uh, building next to his parents' house or on top of it, he's uh, building a chamber where their new home is going to be. And when the preparation is uh, done, then the, uh, the groom's party will take torches and they'll begin the second part of the marriage ceremony, the wedding feast. The groom and the groomsman will march on the streets, usually after sunset, under the light of torches. And they'll march to the home of the bride, where her bridesmaids, or the, which are usually virgins, her friends, are waiting dressed in white robes. And when people see from the distance the, process, the procession of torches, the cry is heard, 
See, the bridegroom is coming. Come out to meet him. Because the groom did not enter the home of his bride. She went out together with her bridesmaids to join this uh, light torches and lamps procession. And then they will march together, uh, the guys holding torches and the girls we uh, wearing their lamps marching toward the home of the groom where the actual wedding feast takes place. Now that you know a little bit about the background of a Jewish wedding, let's study the parable of Jesus. And I'm, uh, I'm telling you, we're we'll gonna discover very interesting things in it. So let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. And I would like uh, someone who uh, is willing to read. We have already uh, Gary. Chapter 25 of Matthew, and Gary is gonna read for us verses two through five. Matthew chapter 25, verses two through five. <clears throat> now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Okay. Here are uh, represented ten virgins. These are the bridesmaids of this wedding party. And at the first glance, there is no difference between them. They have all of them their lamps. All of them are most probably dressed according to the Jewish custom in white. They look the same. All of them have lamps. And for the time being, all of the lamps are burning. Everything looks fine. Outwardly, there is no difference. Yet, a closer look shows that inward there is a difference. It's a very hidden one. You have to look very closely. And what was the difference between the, the two groups of bright mates? What was the difference? The oil. So, the foolish uh, girls, the foolish virgins, acted as if once filling your lamp is enough. Your first experience with God, they thought, is enough. You get baptized, you get committed to God once, and that's enough. 